have you ever wondered why some men who uh, are on testosterone uh, and PDE5 inhibitors, but they're not able to get erections? So keep watching. You know, the, the question I, I, I guess we wanted, we started talking about in the beginning of this was, you know, why is it that some men who are put on testosterone treatment or even uh, PD5 inhibitors, they can't, they, they might have good blood flow, but they're not getting erections. And what can be done about it? I use the analogy of 100 meter dash, sprinting 100 meters. If you look at the world record for 100 meters, one of the Olympics was 24 to 31 years of age. 30 years of age was the range, age range for, for the 100 meters. Now, if you look at the world record for the 100 meters or for 40 year old men, 50 year old men, 80 year old men, every decade it gets lower. So the muscle systems and molecular systems in, a, in an 80 year old are totally different than a 20 year old. So you can restore the testosterone to, to the level, optimal levels of an 18 year old. You still have our 80 year old heart, you still have an 80 year old muscles, you have 80 year old joints, you have an 80 year old neural system, vascular system, rectal tissue. To expect a, a putting testosterone in an 80 year old man, expecting him to function like a, like a 20 year old is, is ridiculous. And that's what, unfortunately, most men, there, there's, there's neural input to, to the nerves that open the blood flow in the penis. And that input comes from the brain. So when you're maximally mentally stimulated, that can generate about half the input to the rectal tissue. The other, the other major half is direct genital stimulation. And then it's five, 10% additional stimulation comes from the nipples, the axillary skin, the lips, and what are called the erogenous zones. A male reaches his sexual prime by 16 to 18, and from that point on, it's downhill. So a, six, a 16, 18 year old could ejaculate maybe eight, six, eight times in an, in an eight hour period. After his first erection, first intercourse, his penis may not even go soft. It may stay, it'll stay hard. And if it does go soft, it is within minutes, he just stimulates himself and he gets a second erection. Lucky. The refractory period might be 15, 20 minutes for the second erection. And then it might be an hour for, after the fourth intercourse, you might have to wait an hour. But now you take that same person, they're now 40 years old, the refractory period might be two hours, an hour, two hours to get to, to have sex a second time. And by the time you're 60, you get it once and you're, you're done for, for a day or two until you can get. When men went on finasteride, I was doing hair transplants. I'm a hair transplant surgeon as well. And I was giving finasteride to, to men. I'd have 18 year olds come in and say, ask them how, there's, how their erections were. And I warned them about the rectal dysfunction. And they'd come in saying, doc, everything's great. I'm amazing. They're joking and laughing like, I said, well, what about your morning erections? My notes here state that you wake up seven out of seven days with a hard erection that stays hard after you pee, and even then it won't go down. How are your morning erections? Oh, well, actually, I haven't had a morning erection since I started taking the finasteride. Mm. I go, well, what, how's your refractory period? You said that after you ejaculated within five minutes, you could get hard again. How, how, how is your second erection? He said, well, actually, this weekend, I tried had sex with my girlfriend, and after an hour, I tried to go again. I couldn't get hard the second time. And he goes, uh, and his face went white. He goes, oh, my God, it's affecting me. But see, most men have to be completely impotent before they will think that they have AD. Meanwhile, you go from just blowing on your penis with, a, with this much stimulation, and you're getting a rock-hard erection, or just someone that you're sexually attracted to walks by and you just have a casual thought and you get a raging erection in your pants, that's a man with good sexual function. And as you get older, the atrophy of the neural systems and those other changes that cause the penis not to react the same. Most men, as long as they can get an erection with stimulation, they're, see, 50%, about half of your stimulation is coming from, from mental and physical and half is mental now if, if you need if, but if you need this much a little bit more more than you can get from direct penal stimulation you need to, you need to maintain this much mental stimulation to keep the erection and you get distracted you're losing your erection most guys will say oh it's in my head yeah but in fact it's actually they had most men 
don't have ED won't, won't even acknowledge it. They have ED. Same thing about libido. In my clinical practice, when men say they have low libido, 19 out of 20 times it's erectile dysfunction, and they don't. They just don't realize that their it's their penis not responding. They're thinking because their penis doesn't get hard that that's why that it's an arousal process. The amount of stimulation you need to get an erection changes. You you get dehydrated. You have high stress, high adrenaline and cortisol, and you're under major stress. And someone's got a gun to your head, and you're you're peripherally vasoconstricted, and all the blood flow is being diverted away from the penis to more vital structures, which is, happens in the stress response. Your ability to get an erection is not is, is impaired. But most men think that because once a once once a month they wake up with a morning erection, they 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 should have no problem at other time. But in fact, the amount of stimulation you need and your ability to achieve an erection multiple physiologic factors that, that impact your, your ability to get an erection. So when as rectal function declines, ED becomes is intermittent. It's when you're tired or stressed, most people just pass it off. Well, I'm tired, I'm not in the mood. But but it really it's a, a, a physiological issue then. Right. Now you get a man who's 80 and his penile nerves are five percent of what they were when he was a teenager and he goes on testosterone and his penile nerves double, triple in size, so they go from 5% to 10%, maybe 15%. He still may not get, be able to get an erection with HRT, and, but he'll find that if he takes the Viagra or Salus or Levitra or any, one of those PD-5 inhibitors that wasn't working or was just working mildly, he's getting dramatically better responses with those medications. Testosterone replacement rescues a lot of men with ED. Now, I, I have a lot to say about that. Once I've seen men stop their HRT, especially if you have severe ED, and you're, you're, uh, I've had men who put on testosterone and they're, they're now, before testosterone, they were getting no erections with PD-5 inhibitors or intracavernosal injections. After they went on testosterone, they were still needing to use Viagra to get an erection. They come back and they're like a teenager again, getting re really strong erections and the partners being satisfied. And they come back three months later saying, Doc, Doc, the pills aren't working anymore. What's going on? And I said, well, are you taking your testosterone? And they go, no. And I say, why not? Because it wasn't working. In their mind, if testosterone did anything, they should have been getting an erection without medication. Mm. And I, I find half these people don't get the erections back when they come on. See, the nerves can re only regenerate us so many times. So there's a profound clonal expansion. And when your telomeres are short, as you get older, your telomeres are shortening and your regenerative capacity is declining. And that's why this thing I was saying about cellular energy, the rate of repair and rate of regeneration, when your rate of repair is way up here, the rate of degeneration is down here. Your cells that are dying, are turning over very slowly, and your telomeres are are shortening at a very slow rate. And when you get older, you're gonna have very long telomeres. But you have a, sh a crap diet, like some, the guy who supersized himself eating McDonald's. Your rate of, when, you, when your rate of repair is, is very close, you're gonna have a, a high percentage of cells every day that are down here that are ending, ending a death spiral of decline. Where, so when, once cellular repair, it becomes slower than cellular regeneration, you have a declining output of enzymatic and metabolic activity of the cell, and the cell enters a death spiral that results in apop. That's what apoptosis is. When your diet and nutrition is poor, your, your tissues are aging and your telomeres are shortened. And that's, so that's, telomeres have a key role in So what can you do to restore those? I mean, uh, stem cell therapy, when, uh, when testosterone and uh, PD-5 inhibitors or intracavernosal injections no longer work, can, can one look to stem cells or, uh, or just do you have to be on testosterone a bit longer? What, what, do, you, what do you think? I, I trained to do stem cells transplants. I was the first doctor in North America, the first group of doctors to be trained to do stem cell transplants. I got shut down by my regulatory college. I was going to use stem cells to, because I have a protocol to restore erectile function and to actually reverse male pattern baldness. Okay, some of that. 
<laughs> what did you find when you started looking into the stem cells uh, for erectile dysfunction? Death by a thousand cuts is one analogy that I like using. There's not one thing that's slowing your cellular systems down. It's all the aluminum and mercury and lead and cadmium and heavy metals and genetically modified foods and pesticides and denatured poor diet and educating yourself and making small incremental changes in eating, learning about what is healthy water and getting a Kenyan water system or reverse osmosis system. Basically, the key thing is to cut out anything that comes in a can or box that has a list of chemicals on it. Mm. That everyone should be eating real food. That means actually something, a vegetable that came from the ground and it was a, is a living, has living cells in it. It's not been ground up and oxidized and denatured and put as a powder in some box. See all these superfoods and powdered drinks. They may contain superfoods, but they've been ground up and oxidized, and they probably have less than one percent of the nutrients that were in that superfood when it first, when it was li a living plant. People need to understand what what healthy is and what. Amazing. That's the key is actually diet and nutrition. So I suppose even even if you have, have stem cell treatments, you, what you're saying is you need to make sure there's no heavy metals or you, you, you're cleaning up your habits first and your diet, and then you can look at stem cells as a possible treatment. PRP activates your endogenous stem cells to increase vascular and, and nerve, neural growth factor, increase smooth muscle replication. But I won't do a PRP on someone uh, until, until I've checked and optimized their testosterone. Or same thing, shockwave. Erectile dysfunction. I will not do. If someone's, I tell people, you're wasting your money getting a shockwave if you're, if you have ED and you're paying someone to give you shockwave therapy. And your testosterone is, nerves are atrophied, the tissues, cellular, you found cellular dysfunction in the erectile tissue. You're gonna, the, the potential benefit from that shockwave is gonna be muted many times over. I see. So we were talking earlier about ED, erectile dysfunction, being a vascular issue. And you, you had some points that you, you weren't in complete agreement with that statement. So I thought you can expand on that. Just like they push certain memes and certain thoughts and there's lots of incredible disinformation going on. My observations, I've probably done over 10,000 penile, maybe 15,000 penile dopplers for, for in 1997 to 2004, I was doing 10 to 12 penile dopplers a day on men with ED. Young men with premature ejaculation or men who had mild forms of ED, we would give them a small dose of intercavernosa medication. There'd be a small increase and they'd get a full rock hard erection with, with maybe seven to 10 cent cubic centimeters of blood flow through the penile artery. All basically I get men, older men with the most severe forms of ED who have no response at all to PD-5s and have, weren't even able to get an erection with maximal dose of intercavernosal. They would get getting blood Doppler blood flows of 20, 30, 40 cubic centimeters of blood per second from cubic millimeters per second of penile blood flow. And their penis would just get a chubby and that would be it. Meanwhile, they're having massive blood flows. So I've observed that men with the most, the more severe the, the the erectile dysfunction, the higher the blood penile blood flow you get, and, and they have ED. So these men, what's happening is, as the system, neural input opens arteries, and instead of the cavernosal sinuses relaxing, cavernosal sinuses relaxing and filling up with blood, they're they're 80, 90 percent fibrous connective tissue with just a occasional little smooth muscle cell, and the young man with if you look at the cavernosal wall is just packs side to side of nothing but pure smooth muscle cells and the penile nerves in a man with with low testosterone have the penile nerves of atrophy. I'm just quoting the animal studies they did where they had 200 rats and they castrated them and gave hormone replacement to 100 so they had, were given daily doses of to match what their gonads would produce and 100 rats didn't and when they looked at the rats that had received the HRT there was absolutely no no there was virtually no difference before and after a castration but the rats that didn't get HRT penile nerves that which under the microscope looked like big cables like this had atrophied the tiny little like they looked like like 
fine hairs compared in the, the cavernous cavern sciences, which were solid muscle cells, were huge gaps and more, probably 60% of the cross-sectional area was just fibrous connective tissue. A small increase in blood flow, the penis can stretch out and expand and that expansion will start collapsing and compressing the cavernosal, the penis outflow. That's, that's, that's what traps the blood and causes the penis to firm up. When, the, when you've got these fibrous connective tissue and blood flow increases, the blood is just flowing through straight through into the vein, the sinuses aren't expanding. And is, that, is that venous leakage? You're referring to venous leakage when that happens? Venous, venous leakage is a, is a change in the elastic properties of the tissues. Just like a young person's joints are very smooth and supple, as you get older, my, my, my fingers are stiff and part of, part of getting older, your connective tissue, your flexibility goes. And an, an older penis is actually stiffer. Now, Stif stiffer as, as far as having more fibrous tissue, not stiffer as getting more erect, because with more fibrous tissue, you don't have as much of the smooth muscle cells, you're saying. If you look at, if this is the tension, and this is the length, a small increase of tension, a pressure, small increase in blood flow, and a small increase in pressure, the cavernous cells can stretch and expand in the penis, the sinuses fill up with blood. When you need a, to get the same amount of stretching, you need a much higher pressure. The, the cavernosal system doesn't ex stretch out and expand, and the, the venoclusive mechanism can't be engaged. They're saying that it's endothelial dysfunction, and there's a, it's arterial, and they've actually gone and given arterial or transplanted arteries to the penile, penis with no effect, no benefit. It's because it's problem is not a blood, an inflow problem. It's basically stress train curve is different. If you're an engineer, you'll know what the stress train curve is. That the, the last tissues, man with, get, easily gets good erections, needs relatively minor increases in blood flow to get the penis to expand and erect. Whereas men with ED, they're, they're having much higher levels of blood flow with much softer erections and much more difficult to maintain. How, how do we fix this? Lifestyle. So, so sleep and having proper biorhythms, eating cleaner, having some regular exercise, managing stress, stress and cortisol. Um, Hippocrates said, I'll quote, that let thy food be thy medicine and thy medicine be thy food. So trying to get to bed at a regular consistent time, so you basically sleep hygiene, of turning off all your tablets and screens and turning the lights down after 10 a.m. or an hour before you plan to have, getting into a regular sleep pattern where you're going to bed. Look at older people, they go to bed early and they wake up early. If you go, if you go to a log cabin without any electricity and stay there for a week, you'll find by the second, third day within 15, 20 minutes of sunrise, you're falling asleep. And at the crack of dawn, you're waking up at 5, 30, 6, 6 in the morning as soon as the sky starts coming up. That's because your biorhythms are starting, your body's starting to get biorhythm. With, with electric, electric light lights, you now it's midnight, 1 in the morning, we still have bright lights in our eyes, and our brain is getting the signal that it's still daylight, don't go to sleep yet. We're disrupting our biorhythms. Exercise dramatically increases mitochondrial and cellular energy. It basically helps burn a lot of the, metabolize a lot of the junk. People who exercise regularly have way better mitochondrial and cellular energy and they're, they're going to be healthier. Eating, eating whole foods, getting your HRT, HRT and those things optimized. So thank you, uh, Dr. Adams, for coming on. If you want to get uh, more information from Dr. Adams, go to his uh, website called askdrkenadams.com and you can uh, you can message him over there and uh, if you liked what you've seen on this channel we'll have some other episodes with dr adams please uh, subscribe uh, press like and leave your comments and if you have any other topics you'd like to talk about uh, we'd be happy to you know, bring it up bring it up next time with uh, with dr adams so thanks again dr adams and um, we'll see everyone next time in your channel